Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> All right, I'm glad to see that that most of you made it back for day two. Um, we got a we got a lot of fun scheduled today. Let me start by telling you two uh, logistical things. We have two changes of our program this morning. Um, first, uh, just a minor flipping of order here. Uh, Kevin Wheeler and Eric Balkin, the second and third talks are flipping positions, so um, not a big deal. A bigger deal is that Daryl V. Hill, who was going to speak today, um, was called away. Um, but um, that's the bad news. The good news is that that Beta Becker has agreed to take that spot, and so that will be that will work nicely, I think. So, thanks, thanks to Beta for agreeing to do that. Um, let me see. You know, I have a few other announcements here. I'm just going to skip them because I want to. I want to get into the program uh, today. You know, today is kind of the 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 thought. Today is to further stimulate thinking about what a new set of rules or what a next step could look like. And again, the, the, with the spirit of let's define that that space of what it could look like as broad as possible, and then you know reality will set in and it will get shaved down a bit. But let's start our thinking about um, thinking in a very broad terms. And, and to do that, we're going to start with Jack Schmidt. Um, Jack is a professor and director of the Center for Colorado River Studies at Utah State University. And he was formerly the chief of the USGS Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center. Um, but most importantly, in this context, he has a, he has a research program called the Future of the Colorado River, or is it Colorado River Futures program, where Jack is looking at this issue of, of, of different, um, what's his think, his terminology is alternative management paradigms. You know, if we allow ourselves to think about doing things differently, um, what 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 options are on the table if we do that? So, Jack, are you ready to go? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, I volunteered to be the first guy, so we can all sort of gradually wake up. Um, uh, I won't take it personally if you have to run out. Uh, and grab a little more coffee to get ready for the next talk. I can take it. Uh, okay, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here. I'm going to provide some uh, perspective on some some issues um, that I think are relevant in this conversation. Um, in some ways, uh, we now have a large project uh, collaborating with institutions um, that are directly uh, cooperating on this project are listed here, and, and CADS West has been gracious in helping us uh, start to, to get going. Uh, we also have gotten some great help with reclamation. So um, with that, let me dive in. What I want to do today is, first off, I don't really, I, I, I'm going to do this very quickly, but I just want to remind us that uh, we actually stand on the shoulders of lots of unreasonable ideas. And so um, uh, we shouldn't be afraid. And then I want to um, take a second and talk about um, how water supply intersects with this other attribute of the Colorado River, which is the river itself and uh, aquatic ecosystems. And then I want to talk a bit about uh, some aspects of, um, of our project. And then Kevin Wheeler will follow me and clean up the mess that I create as the front man. Um, it is important that we think about uh, way out of the box uh, alternatives. Um, it may be that's the only way we can get out of the jam that we might be in. And of course, uh, some people thought that the idea of creating Grand Canyon National Monument in 1907 was a crazy idea, and it was opposed by many locals. And yesterday, we heard a reference to E.C. LaRue and estimates of runoff uh, in the Colorado River Basin. 
And um, this is LaRue's proposal for dams, including small low-head dams entirely damming up the Colorado River and Grand Canyon that was made in that same 1916 report. Ironically, the creation of the monument and the proposal to do this uh, came um, less than a decade, who came within a decade of each other. Some people might think that a Rube Goldberg scheme to drill tunnels out of Flaming Gorge and the, of course, uh, Echo Park Reservoir, which everyone knew would be built, and then snaking that water and trading water all the way to central Utah was either exactly the idea that people should pursue or not. And of course, it was awesomely um, unreasonable to ever suggest to not do that. And the first battle to not do that, the fight against Echo Park Dam, was utterly unreasonable. Um, massive importations, import schemes. Um, uh, um, were proposed, the Pacific Southwest Water Plan, and of course the wildest one of all, the North American Water and Power Alliance, which would have built Ramparts Dam on the Yukon River and routed that water all the way down to the Pacific Southwest, delivering 78 million acre feet a year um, to uh, the United States. Um, in the Carter administration, proposals to expand energy production, to put turbines on the river outlets at Flaming Gorge and Glen Canyon Dam, proposed by the department by reclamation, to build a pump storage dam facility in Cataract Canyon, to build new dams in the upper these were all proposed in the late 1970s. I was lucky enough to be one of the people who thought up and suggested the idea of controlled floods. It was uh, four or five of us. Um, it was a wonderful time. And in the late 1980s, for the first time when a group of scientists met with reclamation to suggest that the idea of intentionally releasing high flows to stir up sediment and rebuild beaches was proposed, the main representative for reclamation got up, stood at the edge of the room and said, you will never talk about that again and walked out of the room. Um, it was a long story to ever have that 1996 flood occur. Um, that idea started as a crazy idea. And of course, there are ideas that are perceived as crazy today, and we'll hear a little bit more about these crazy ideas in later talks. Okay, the second point I want to make is that, you know, yesterday we mostly talked about water supply, but there is this other thing called the river. So let's talk about how the river and water supply decisions intersect. Now, um, the high flow protocol that implements and codifies the controlled flood uh, 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 concept was implemented uh, for the first time in water year 2012. And since 2012, these six years, we've implemented, I think, four um, or five, four or five High flows, I'll look at the next slide to see what that is. Um, let's just look at the big picture. During that, those six years, like 9.3 million tons of sand were delivered to Grand Canyon from the Perea and the Little Colorado River. About the same amount went out. So the high flow protocol doesn't conserve sand in Grand Canyon but it, was, it does redistribute where it is to um, build and maintain sandbars, if only for short amounts of time, to create a better ecological and recreational experience. But sort of think about it, what goes in goes out, and we sort of re 
shuffle the deck chairs. Um, during those six years, we have had better than average sand inputs from the Perea River. In red are the years of the controlled floods. So we've sort of, we're sort of keeping, you know, we're sort of passing sand through. We're and these are in years of good input, okay? There's only been one bad year. Um, we have talked yesterday about the concept of equalization. And the last big releases out of Glen Canyon Dam were in 2011 when nearly 13 million acre feet were transferred to um, Lake Mead. This was in the two years before the high flow protocol was established. Ironically, the primary year of big water transfer was a complete bust for sand inputs from the Perea River. Well, if you release one hell of a lot of water out of Flaming Gore, out of Glen Canyon Dam, and no sand comes in from the Perea in that year, for the two years that include equalization, 2.3 million tons of sand came in. Somewhere between five and six million went out. The difference between the two was erosion of sand out of the system. What we don't understand is where that sand comes from and whether it comes from places that will never be able to put it back or not. Obviously, the next six years after this were sort of a wash. What came in, what went out, right? The next six years that followed equalization. In the two preceding years, we evacuated twice as much as came in. We didn't reaccumulate that the next six years. So the decision to equalize was, is decoupled from the environmental conditions in Grand Canyon to ask whether Grand Canyon is capable of, of absorbing those high releases from an ecological standpoint. Shift gears. We know that Lake Powell thermally stratifies. We know that the elevation of the penstocks when the reservoir is full are releasing water out of the hypolimnion. We know that that water is about nine degrees C. We know that the water is quite cool when Powell is full. We know that when Powell is 40% full or getting lower and lower, the releases are warmer. Water storage decisions affect the river temperature downstream. And so in work by Kim Dibble and a number of us, uh, um, mostly staff of the GCMRC, this is sort of a thermal depiction of the, gray, of the Colorado River system, showing that in the summer, let's just focus on the colors, that Grand Canyon is sort of unusually cold place. And it has a unique and novel assemblage of fish, including the endangered humpback chub and razorback suckers living down here, but it's sort of an odd place only maintained when the reservoir is full because of the cold releases. Uh, one of the most important messages that I'm making today is that all of these decisions about how to reallocate water implicitly bring with them decisions about where to store water. Where to store water affects what the temperatures of the releases will be. The biggest ecosystem driver of aquatic ecosystems is river temperature. So your decisions about where to store water and how to allocate water will seal the fate and determine what the nature of the river ecosystems will be. And this sequence of climate change necessitating political response, necessitating management response, will change ecosystem drivers of flow regime, sediment supply, river temperature, in turn, will change ecosystems. And we can either make these changes and ultimately have these effects either intentionally or unintentionally. 
And so our project is an effort to look at the joint problem of water supply and ecosystems and how the two um, uh, work together. We are trying to develop new tools and approaches that are useful within the context of CRSS modeling to at least explore the environmental outcomes of water supply decisions and work with reclamation. And hopefully reclamation will think that some of our work is worthwhile and incorporate into their decision framework. And then we want to look at a range of water supply alternatives. Uh, in the interest of time, um, just because I gave away this talk, like we posted it last night, I'm going to go quick, very quickly right now in the, in the interest of making some late points. Um, our focus is Flaming Gorge Dam to uh, Lake Mead. We're building component-based models and physics-based models uh, to predict the evolution of downstream water temperature. We're um, uh, 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 building this and, and hoping to predict temperatures at the same nodes used in CRSS modeling. And we're also looking at the tools that reclamation uses um, and using them in a way to project far out into the future what will be the outcomes of re develop the capacity to um, predict what water release temperatures from reservoirs will be um, in however you all decide to allocate water storage. And I would just say that the CQAL2 model to um, predict reservoir limnology in Lake Powell, um, we've got good collaboration with reclamation and using this for our purposes. But one of the interesting things is that sometimes models within uh, agencies uh, are used in a certain context. In the case of, of um, the modeling at Lake Powell, the model is reinitialized every year in January. And so the long-term capacity of that model to predict what's actually hap going to happen has not really been tested. Um, that's in black. In blue is real measurements, and we just sort of ran the model for a long period of time, and it doesn't do a very good job of predicting what actually happens. And uh, so we're trying to work on this. I, I think I just need to go through this part quickly. Um, the physics-based model, a radiation-driven system, has um, uh, John Karen, uh used a similar approach in looking at water temperatures below Flaming Gorge Dam. Uh, the work by Scott Wright in Grand Canyon is a very empirical monthly-based model. And we're trying to seek to actually predict the daily fluctuations of temperature so that we can essentially have a coupled reservoir river model temperature that we can then link with the outputs of what Kevin Wheeler's doing with CRSS modeling so we can sort of look at some ecosystem effects. Not everything is perfect. Uh, red is reality. Blue is our prediction at National Canyon. We've got work to do. But here's the next piece of the puzzle. Were it so simple, I mean, in one sense, river temperature, what have you, is physics. At least, OK, there's uncertainty, but we can sort of deal with it. But were it so simple that the resources that many of you care about, like fish assembly or ESA um, species, only depended on the thermal regime of the river? But unfortunately, it's whether they eat drifting fish or other fish, whether they cruise, they used to cruise from uh, Wyoming to Yuma, or whether they hang out in the same place through their entire life. And then, of course, it also depends on channel and floodplain habitats, which is yet another axis. And so the next piece of the puzzle, we just received funding from the USGS Climate Adaptation Science Center, is to bring together all of the best fish scientists in the watershed to talk about our predictions of changes in ecosystem drivers and what the fish outcomes will be. And realize that there are complicated pieces of this puzzle. Fish 
scientists are beginning to think, uh, some pe- this is going to make some people really nervous, um, that the existence of Pierce Ferry Rapid as a barrier to migration of warm water, non-native, competitive, and predatory fish in Lake Mead that keeps them out of the Western Grand Canyon is a really good thing and would and should be continued. That essentially would cap the storage, right, of mead to preserve Pierce Ferry Rapid as a, as a barrier. I mean, there are all sorts of unintended consequences. Um, one more piece of this. Every number here, whether it's in red or green, is the ratio of how much sand was, it, was removed out of Marble Canyon in that year in relationship to how much came in. Remember that on the Perea River there are good years, big monsoon seasons, bad years. And we've had high releases and low releases. This is 8.23. So a dot is the combination of how much water was released from Powell and how much sand came in from the Perea in that year, okay? These are the decisions that you guys are arguing about. This is the phenomenon that is completely decoupled from water supply management, but the two matter. And, well, there's not much spread in the data because, you know, most years, here are the 8.23 million acre foot releases. Here are releases that were less than that. Here are these 9.0 releases. Here are the two equalization releases. 5.9 means six times more sediment was eroded from Marble Canyon than came in. We don't know that the system recovers from that. So this is simply a reminder that these decisions about, oh, it's terrible that the upper basin is giving the lower basin more water than it deserves. We shouldn't give them nine. That actually has an environmental implication in Grand Canyon. Releasing lesser amounts has an environmental implication in Grand Canyon. Equalization has an environmental implication in Grand Canyon. We need to also think about this stuff. Um, there's, there's lots of talk about, um, Laura, are, Lauren, are you here? Oh, darn it. Make sure you tell her I use the words deep uncertainty. Um, uh, I just want to point out, uh, you know, we've talked about different modeling strategies and robust decision making was pursued by reclamation and the basin study, dynamic adaptive policy pathways, is another really um, uh, uh, rich possibility. Um, there's lots of, ex- I, I think Jim Prairie and the group at University of Colorado are really pushing this and w- we hope to jump on their coattails. Um, we build these big ecosystem models of how the system will behave all the way to food base and native fish and realize that there is uncertainty at different levels, including deep uncertainty at every part of this. The modeling strategy is gonna be immensely difficult. All right, so um, the project, watershed running, uh, runoff, we can stand on the shoulders of many other research groups trying to predict what the brave new world will be. And uh, David Tarbot and Brad Udall, postdocs, are working on this and we stay appraised of uh, the best estimates of the scenarios for this. Kevin Wheeler is gonna talk about our strategies for looking at alternatives, um, uh, uh, management paradigms for the river. We're looking at the joint outcomes to ecosystems and water supply and how that translates uh, to fish communities and other resources. And uh, that's our jargon, alternative paradigms. And we're looking at the crazy stuff to push the conversation. Preferentially store water in PAL, preferentially store water in Mead. Eliminate equalization as a management target. Um, Will uh, the larval flow triggers at Flaming Gorge Dam be able to be implemented in the future under climate change? Uh, What if PAL's operated as a run of the river facility? 
I know that no one's going to do what we suggest. All we can do is be provocative enough that some of you might say, you know, gee, there might be something to that. Hey, Jim, would you rerun that and see whether those guys are crazy or whether there's something to that idea? That's how policy gets changed. In the end, everything we do, if it has any substance, will be redone by a reclamation. We know that, but we're trying to expand the conversation. So last point. If you're going to optimize outcomes between water supply and environmental out, uh, objectives, you've got to have an environmental objective. <clears throat> the only objective that I can figure exists clearly for the basin is recover T and E species. Everything else is sort of feel good. Make it a little better. Have a few more sandbars. Have a few more cottonwood trees. But they aren't fixed, firm objectives that anybody's willing to fall on their sword about. The upper basin programs are all about recover the fish while allowing water development to proceed. That's not a clear objective for the environment. The lower basin is create a certain acreage of habitat, not much more. Certainly not the species themselves. Why? Because at least recreating habitat is an objectively measured phenomenon. Whether it makes a difference or not is not known. Uh, my favorite whipping boy, uh, desired future conditions in Grand Canyon. Uh, these are all the objectives that the stakeholders want and some of these are mutual.